I think we can move on to our second presentation. Uh, Artash and Arushi Nath will talk to us about uh, do-it-yourself asteroid astrometry uh, using Python. Go ahead, guys. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Artash Nath. I'm a grade nine student here in Toronto. Hello, everyone. I'm Arushi, and I'm in grade six. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about do-it-yourself asteroid astronomy using Python. So, I love asteroids. I'm going just in them. Asteroids are objects which, just like planets like the Earth, orbit around the Sun. Most asteroids are found in between Mars and Jupiter, but our planet is uncertain. Sometimes they go, they go beyond that, that limit, and sometimes they can go very near the Earth. So when they go near the Earth, they're called near-Earth asteroids. But if they go very close, they're called potentially hazardous asteroids. And it's very important to keep observing these because sometimes it, it's possible that one of these asteroids path will intersect with the path of the Earth. So I got very interested when I found this out, and I wanted to learn as much about asteroids as I want, as I could. So I decided, why not actually look at an asteroid and try to find the most information about them, like their velocity, for example. So I decided to start with 99942 above this asteroid. Why? Well, first of all, Apophis is one of the potentially hazardous asteroids, PHAs. And in 2004, astronomers detected over a 2.7% chance that this asteroid will intersect with the Earth or the Moon. And in nine years from now, in 2029, the Apophis will go very close to the Earth, just 31,000 kilometers. So that's even closer than some of our satellites. So I want to take the first step to getting the data about this asteroid was to actually look at it. So for this, unfortunately, I could not use my own telescope that I have at my home because its aperture is around 15 centimeters. That meant that it was not enough to capture enough light to see dim objects because this well, this asteroid is quite dim right now. Like it's around 18 magnitude. And when I started this project in November, it was magnitude 20. So I needed to use a robotic telescope, which means from my home, I can control the telescope very far away. So I started doing some research. The first telescope I found out was from the SLU website. There, they had a oh, telescope called Chile 2. And it really helped me get into the basics of how to operate a robotic telescope. And I learned a lot of new things. But unfortunately, when I aimed it up at a box, I was not able to see the asteroid because still the aperture was not enough, 43 centimeters. So I needed to look for a new telescope. I found out about I telescope where they gave many telescopes and you were able to book reservation. I looked at a T11 telescope in deep space. But unfortunately here, it was not, this was still not enough aperture. So I knew I knew I needed to get a big change so I can look at the asteroid. That's when I saw the Fulks Telescope Project from the Las Cumbres Observatory. Their telescope had a aperture of two meters, so that would be enough for me to take observations. So I contacted them and they generously gave me, ac gave me access a couple hours in my day to their telescope when they heard about my project and how I wanted to learn more about asteroids, especially at Bots. So now I had a good telescope to take observations. Now it was time to actually take the picture of a box. But for that, I would have to know where to look at because you can't just tell the telescope to point at a box. You have to be more specific. So I went on the telescope use website where they gave me a right ascension and declination of my box. After. 
But unfortunately, they only updated it every day. And as Tesco had a field of view relatively small of 10 by 10 Earth minutes, it might have disappeared by the time I actually get them from these coordinates. So I needed to get more accurate rate centered and declination coordinates. So here I found out about the NASA Horizons project. And here they gave me daily uh, they gave me daily rate section and declination coordinates of the asteroid. So this was good. Now I wanted to know when exactly should I take the observation? Because I need to know when is my when is the asteroid gonna be above the horizon and when it's gonna be below the horizon. So here I had two options. Telescopius, both Telescopius, and the Pope's Telescope website gave me this data. So as you can see in the graph, you can see that this kind of like a peak. And the best visibility time was 14 to 17 of month UTC. So now with this information, I could go back to the NASA Horizon thing, project and I could get that exact time. I did the observation. The next day, the telescope had got the image. So I had to use a special software to open this image because it wasn't in a normal JPEG or PNG format, but it was in a FITS file format. So when I opened the image, well, why FITS files? Why not just a normal image file? The thing is, FITS files have more than just the image. It also has lots of data about the image. For example, which telescope took the image, when did it take the image, which camera was used to take the image, and so on. So this would be useful later on. But when I opened the image, I didn't, ex I didn't find multiple stars or objects as I expected. I found a black screen with one dim object. So I was really surprised. I thought, did I underexpose it? Did I overexpose it? But I soon found out it was nothing to do with that. The thing is, I had to scale the image before I can use it. What does that mean? Well, when I get the image, it's it's um the pixel the pixel brightness it has a high range, so it doesn't take higher brightnesses better than lower brightnesses. So I had to in decrease this range. So as you can see in these four figures, the first image is black. And then slowly, you can see first only the bright objects. And then on the last figure, you can see lots of objects. And actually, if you look at the four bottom graphs, you can see that the first one is from minus 200 to almost half a million is a range of the brightness. That, that was too much. And in the last one, you can see it's being reduced to 50 to 200. And the top image was good. So now we've finished scaling my image. It was time to actually start. So first what I did is I inserted this image into a part, into the worldwide telescope in a software. And I was actually able to see the image in the whole sky. So it just gave me, this told me something, two things actually. The first, it verified that I took in the right Right ascension and definition coordinates and put it in the telescope when I took the image because I could verify it with the software. And it also told me because the thing is, when I get the image in the telescope, it sometimes is flipped or rotated. So this would tell me what was the rotation or flipping of this image. So, but if you look at this image, remember my main goal was to look at the pockets, asteroid. But how would I know which of these images are false? So I had to do something about that. So I decided to actually overlay the, the catalog on top of this image. So that, because the thing is, this, this catalog would tell me stars, but I was not interested in stars. I was interested in asteroids. So it would be able to remove all the stars from the image or tell me what the stars were. So I knew that none of those objects were the asteroid. So as you can see in the second figure, there is a, re a red circle around some of these objects. That meant that these were recognized stars. But the 
problem was, there was still some or many objects that didn't have red circles. How do I know which one it is? So I overlaid the plat minor planet center database, which told me about the asteroids, and I was actually able to find the 99942 Apophis asteroid inside the image, as you can see in the second figure. And you can see it's in the third line of asteroids. And if you verify in this image, we can see that the third one is, does not have a red circle on it. So that's verification because I'm just verifying that it's the asteroid because it wouldn't have a red circle. So I did the exact same process with the second image of Apophis that I did the next day because I wanted to find stuff about the motion of the asteroid, which meant that I needed to find two images so I can see the difference of the right assumption and declination for it. So as you can see in this image, I can asteroid, the asteroid in both the images, taken a date from each other. And put the exact coordinate of this asteroid. That was actually calculating the motion or proper motion, so I say, because we're only seeing a 2D image so we can only see the minimum distance the asteroid traveled because it might have traveled in the third dimension, but we wouldn't know. So finding, I used Pythagorean for this. So finding the first side, so basically the change in definition was quite easy. I just subtracted the two in arc minutes. But the rate ascension was more difficult because the rate ascension actually the distance between the right ascension actually change depending on if you're near the equator where the right ascension distance would be bigger and if you're near the poles where it would be much smaller. So I actually had it, I actually needed to use the definition as well to find the distance in the two right ascensions. So I found a formula which basically I found the, I multiplied the difference in right ascensions with the cost of the average of the two declination coordinates from each image. And I found out in whole that the proper motion of a was 3.13 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus six degrees per second. So now, as I said before, this was a minimum. And I I'm also actually really interested in Python programming. So I wanted to replicate the steps of using those two images and locating the asteroid in those two images, but using no other software, just using my own Python programming skills. So there were seven main steps in Python to finding the asteroid in the image, and I'm gonna go through six right now. The first step was first importing the libraries I'm gonna use in Python to help me with the image data. Libraries are just like functions or tools I can use inside my code to make the process easier. So I opened the fix file using a library called AstroPy, which is really useful for astronomical data. And I displayed the image from with, that's been read by the Python file on the right. And once again, just like Arushi said earlier in the presentation, I also got a black screen with very few stars, just one dim object in the upper left. So my second step was to scale the image, the pixel value inside the image so I could actually see objects inside it. And I did this based on the standard deviation and the mean of the image. So on the right, you can see the scaled image, which has much more objects inside it. Third step. So I needed more information on this image. And the fix file, as I already explained before, is not like JPEG. It, just, it doesn't just store the image. It also stores a header that has a lot of useful information about the image. And there were four things I used Python to extract these values from the fix file. The first one it was the right ascension and declination of the center point of my image. The second one was the pixel scale of each pixel in the image. And the pixel scale is really just the size of each image, the size of each image in degrees. For example, if our camera 
was taking a 10 degree by 10 degree image and had 100 by 100 pixels, then each of the pixels would be one tenth of a degree by one tenth of a degree in pixel scale. So we the CCD size, and this was just a number of pixels inside the image. And finally, the focal length of the telescope was also taken. Now, I had my image, but I didn't know what are these objects, like before, was the asteroid. So I queried a star catalog from the United States and Naval Observatory, which has a huge catalog of all the known stars uh, across the skies. So I took the stars from the catalog that were around in this image and overlaid them onto the image. So at the bottom, you can see in the original image that I took from the previous slide. And you can also see a lot of red circles that have been overlaid on this image. And these red circles are the known stars from the catalog. But you might also notice that they don't map any of the stars on the image. And you know what? This is because they need to be rotated until they match the stars on the image. So I created another Python function that would rotate all these small circles uh, until it found the best fit. So on the right, after the program rotated all the circles by 180 degrees, which is just a flip, all the red things overlay on most or on a lot of the stars in the image. So here's the original image I had taken from the left. And on the right is the image, but it's overlaid with the, uh, the star catalog, known stars. And here we go. On the center, we see our bright object that isn't surrounded by a circle. And that is our astronaut. So I did the same process with the second image. So I was able to locate the after using my Python program in both of the images. And I did the same process, the same process of calculating the distance between these two and the asteroid over the time, and got the same speed of the asteroid as we did using the astronaut method. And this project wouldn't have been possible with, without two, like, two things. First is the actual bulk telescope project, which gave us time that which actually we were able to get the actual images so we could perform all this analysis. The second is the Berg Gaffney Observatory and the Abbey Ridge Observatory, where we were able to get test images from their observatory. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Hey guys, this is amazing stuff you're doing. You're on your way to turning professional. Congrats. Let's go to Word. Any questions for the guys? Hi, um, uh, one question from Blake um, for Arufi. Uh, did you use uh, Fitz Liberator to uh, stretch and scale the image? Actually, we're scaling the images. I used a software called SAO Image, DS9. Excellent. So I imagine many softwares are possible, that, but that's the one I found. Fair enough, David. Your uh, your skills in coding, uh, Artesh, are, are are pretty impressive. Well done. Thank you. No more questions. No more questions. Okay. Thank you, Word. Uh, thank you again, uh, Artesh and Arushi, for your presentation. Well done. Mm -hmm.